Before we talk about the Greek and Persian Wars, a word from our sponsor. Armchair History TV is the newest place to find your favorite history content creators. It's ad-free, unlike this, unfiltered, with an extensive library of over 150 videos and counting, with an exclusive podcast and Discord community to help you keep up with all the action. Watch exclusive content on a regular basis, like my own video here, on the Highland Charge, available nowhere else. Use code HISTORYLAND for 50% off your subscription. Okay guys, enjoy the video. Hello ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Adventures in Historyland YouTube channel. Today, through the medium of sort of the synergy of podcasts, I am uh, joined today by uh, Dr. Roel Kanaanendijk, who is a Derby Fellow at uh, Oxford University. Derby, is it Derby, uh, Derby Fellow of History? Yeah, no, so it's Derby Fellow in Ancient History, in which ancient is history. something we do at Lincoln College. So that, that's my college. But yeah, Lincoln, Lincoln College. College Oxford, Oxford. Oxford. Yes. See, I warned you about this. I warned you. Anything where I have, I, I didn't remember. I mean, it's arcane, to be fair. I mean, every college does things differently, and there's like 40 of them. So like, never mind. But <laughs> no, no, it's, it's my brain. I mean, uh, you told this to me literally a second ago, and it's gone now. So <laughs> there's a little snapshot into, you know, how. I, I'm happy enough you got the surname right. I mean, this is more. <laughs> This is rare in my experience. Yay, we, we won, we've won that battle. Um, you may actually know Roel from some very popular uh, YouTube videos already. Um, uh, that's where I first saw your face and heard you speak about ancient history uh, on the Insider channel. And so, you know, not that they need the publicity, but you should check them out because they're good videos. And uh, Insider, you know, Keep getting roles to do stuff for, you know, I'll stand in for him. So, you know, I, 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 <laughs> if you ever want to find out why everyone on my Twitter keeps telling me to dig ditches, this is, uh, <laughs> this is your chance. There you go. Find out the mystery of that. Today, we're back to talk about ancient history. I say we're back as if he's returned because uh, a few weeks ago, two or three weeks ago, I think, actually, it seems longer, um, uh, I was... Uh, filling in on History Hack, the podcast, and Roel was a guest. And like any good YouTube channel host, I immediately decided to poach him for my channel. So, exactly, we're here to talk once more about the Greek and Persian Wars and to cover some things that we didn't get to cover in that podcast. Roel, first of all, what is it that you love about this period, actually? Why don't you... So I started studying ancient warfare when I, when I was an undergrad. I initially, obviously, you know, being a stereotypical teenager, was really interested in World War II. Um, but I already kind of felt when I was studying history that I shouldn't really try to turn that into, into my field because that would ruin all the fun. Um, but then ancient warfare really caught my eye because I was already at the time, of course, enjoying all these movies and, and playing all these games of playing Rome Total War, which was still new at that time. That's how long ago this is. Um, but um, it really made me wonder how much we really know about that, because with anything in ancient history, it's always a question of we tell each other lots of stories, lots of anecdotes, and lots of things go around that are very, you know, we, we get the impression that it's very well understood. But when you dig into it, you always find that there is actually very little evidence for most of it. And so I wanted to know, like, how, how solid is our understanding, really? When you when you really dig down into it, when you look at all the evidence, how much do we really know for certain? How much are we speculating on? How much is reconstructed, et cetera? Um, and for that exact reason, I think the Persian Wars and classical Greece, so the, the, the two centuries that follow, are particularly interesting because on the one hand, it's the first period for which in Greek history we have really, really good evidence. We have literary descriptions, we have material remains, we have depictions, we have all sorts of things um, that, you know, almost everything that we find has some relation to warfare because it's such a big you know, element of Greek life. Um, but at the same time, there are lots and lots of open questions surprisingly many things that we really aren't that certain about. And the Persian War period in particular is really important in that, firstly, because it's the, the, the earliest war in Greek history for which we have historical accounts of the battles. So there's, you know, if you wanted to study Greek warfare, I mean, some ancient historians have literally said, before the Persian War, there's no point, so I'm just not going to bother. We're going to start here, um, which is, I think, you know, not necessarily how we do it now, but it, it's it's something that they do because the, the historical accounts suddenly appear now, like in that period. And the second part is because of that, 
you get to ask all sorts of questions like, okay, so if this is the way they fight now in the earliest battles that we have, you know, that we have a council, is that because this is a long established tradition or is this something that's only just emerging as something that these authors can describe, you know, something that they're sort of first finding out like, oh, we can we can write a battle description now because from, you know, the chaos of ill-organized sort of militia battles, we now have something resembling sort of military organization and tactics. And now we can start talking for real about how a battle develops and how it's won. And so for me, it's, it's a really fascinating period because it's that transition, right, from mm. earlier poetic descriptions of fighting to very concrete descriptions of actual battles that actually happen. And then the question of um, transitioning from something that is sort of very sort of nebulous and ill-organized to something more like organized warfare in the way that we like to talk about it when we talk about the campaigns of Alexander or Julius Caesar or whatever else. Um, that's only just sort of starting to come into focus. And that's why this period is so fascinating. Definitely, definitely, totally agree. And so what do you think then, bearing that in mind, uh, how does the sort of the myth, the popular perception almost of the Persian Wars, which is essentially Greece defending European civilization um, with their dogged phalanxes and citizen soldiers um, against the evil <coughs> oriental silk laden tyrant perfumed tyrants uh sort of how, how does that how does that on that level and how does that on sort of the military level stack up against what you know to be the truth i mean it doesn't it doesn't much at all but obviously <laughs> there are very good reasons why we tell that story partly is because the greeks already started telling that story <laughs> because they loved it you know they couldn't believe what they had just done um which is the, you know check the expansion of the persian empire which was you know the superpower of their world um, to some extent, it is actually incredible what they achieved, um, you know, in, in to some extent. I don't really want to <laughs> diminish this too much. I mean, they did defeat that army and fleet, um, whether to the Persians that was as significant a blow as it was to uh, in the eyes of the Greeks is, is open to question. Um, but because they they achieved something that they never could have expected to to achieve, um, it immediately starts to starts to become distorted in the way they tell that story. So it immediately becomes this story of this great heroism and all the things that they saved from Persian Persian barbarism and uh, the way that they start depicting the Persians starts to change. The way they talk about the Persians start to change. Um, they start to develop this sense that they are, you know, Greeks as a, as a community against the world, which is still quite new. You can't really point to very much before that period that determines that the Greeks are, you know, a single ethnicity. So there's a lot of, um, uh, of, of ways in which the Greek view of the world was kicked off by this, by this particular victory. So the way in which they started seeing themselves and seeing the Persians was driven by the fact that they won. And that implies that if they hadn't, that that all, all of that story obviously would have been totally different. But in particular, the, the whole way that we perceive that story of Western civilization fighting off Eastern despotism and all that kind of narrative that just simply wouldn't exist. Um, and frankly, you know, there's a lot of reason why we should question that narrative anyway, and why a lot of scholars now have backed away from it. Mostly the fact that I mean, Persia doesn't snuff out other civilizations. It doesn't destroy other cultures or their practices. It has no tradition of doing so. And in fact, it openly supports local traditions, customs, and even political systems if that makes subjects more inclined to do the Persians' bidding. So, for instance, you know, the Persian king in Egypt portrays himself as a pharaoh in, and per performs all of the rituals of a pharaoh among Greek states, such as the ones in, in Western Asia Minor that they control, they have to act like a sort of distant overlord, but leave these cities their own local autonomy, because that's the way they, they are happiest, you know, that's how they, um, how they prefer to exist. And that's the best way to get them to, you know, pay the tribute and, and show up when they're needed. So there is no reason to believe that Persian, that the Persian invasion, if it had been successful, um, would have destroyed democracy or snuffed out Western civilization, whatever that means, you know, whatever we, however we take that narrative, there's just no way to to dress this up as, as something that pivotal. Um, the other question, of course, is to what extent we can say that the Greeks were the ancestors of something that we see as our values or our systems, our institutions, because let's be honest, I mean, the Greek world is very different from our own in a lot of ways that we really don't um, wish to, portray as as in any way inspirational i mean the way that they treated 
uh, the way that they casually accepted the reality of enslavement, for instance, or the inferior status of women, or the way that they treated foreigners, or the way that they organized their societies to maintain very rigid social stratification. There's all sorts of ways in which the Greeks, to us, are, are you know, different to the point of abhorrence, and we really don't want to portray ourselves or to identify ourselves too much um, with the Greeks in that narrative. Even if we find the story of their resistance to the Persians very inspiring, we have to be very careful to be like, are these really the heroes we want to identify with? Or do we just really like the story of, you know, an underdog essentially defending itself against a superpower? Because those are very different things. And we shouldn't too easily let, you know, the the the, the romanticism of one of those edge us into the other, essentially. <laughs> Just because the Greeks won and they were the underdog doesn't mean that they are necessarily, you know, worthy of praise and admiration and emulation. I mean, that is that is an entirely separate question. And a lot of the things that we admire about the Greeks also, you have to say, emerge after their victory in the Persian Wars, when there is much more both incentive and space for Greeks to express themselves in ways that are new and innovative because they've gained a lot in status and wealth in the world by that point. And that is when you really start to see a lot of this Greek culture emerging. So the extent to which um, to which that's even connected to what's being defended in the Persian Wars is is, is very much open to question. Um, it's, it's something that's been interesting in sort of uh, Greco-Persian studies, you might call, that's come uh, to the fore right now. It's the questioning of the old idea that um, if if the Persians took a, won the war, that would have been the end of the Greek st the system. Um, and obviously, if you just look at the the course of imperial Persian history, actually the answer is, you know, of all the things you can answer, that one seems quite clear. Um, from a sort of a military point of view, you have <coughs> you know, several bench, quite a few benchmarks through these uh, wars, at, again, at a popular level, we're talking sort of a very general, uh, as a general level here, uh, you have Marathon, you have the the battles of the, the famous invasion, you might call it, the, the movie, the Hollywood invasion, um, <laughs> uh, uh, Thermopylae, uh, Salamis, and Plataea, and then there's sort of a big gap where the Greeks just sort of kill each other uh, and mess around. <laughs> And then you have Alexander the Great. Now, I can notice from sort of these bench popular benchmarks a massive change in the way the Greeks are doing things from the start, like from the beginning of the Persian Wars to what you might call the last Persian War. Mm. Um, what do you think? What, I think one of the biggest questions people say is why couldn't the Persians action what 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 messed the passions up right? <laughs> what allowed the greeks to to claim this victory yeah no that's that's an excellent it's still an excellent question i think i mean currently it's actually uh, a question that's part of the a level program for if you're doing ancient history in the uk right now this is uh, <laughs> if you're in school right now this is relevant spoiler um, alert <laughs> is, yeah exactly but it is it is a very interesting question because traditionally of course and already to some extent in Herodotus, the narrative is simply that persians although they've conquered this, conquered this enormous empire, somehow militarily, they're just not up to a, a Greek challenge. You know, their, their infantry is weak, they're poorly equipped, they just rely on massive numbers, which don't actually have any skills. That's the traditional narrative. So the, so the Greeks, by being, you know, have more heavily equipped and more disciplined and more sophisticated in their tactics, they were able to um, to crush this invasion quite easily. Now, this is obvious nonsense, even from the simple fact that 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 up to that point it had been normal for Greeks to lose when they fought Persians, you know they had regularly done so in the uh, in in Western Asia Minor in particular, and very recently during the Ionian Revolt, numerous Greek states had rebelled against the Persians. The Persians had sent armies, not even royal armies, just like you know relatively minor expeditionary forces to quell this revolt, and they had been you know, almost entirely successful. They had suffered almost no setbacks whatsoever. You just roll over this Greek resistance, including in pitched battles, you know, where they had support from other peoples, etc. So there is no reason for a Greek army to believe that this will be easy, right? Um, and in fact, you know, we get various hints that this is something that is, is an, a narrative that emerges after the victories that isn't really in line with expectations. So for instance, when the Athenians fi uh, faced the Persians at Marathon, 
Herodotus stresses that this, they were actually terrified because no one would dare to stand up to the Persians because the Persians obviously had a reputation for being completely invincible, which they had, you know, well and truly earned over several generations of conquests. So you don't just think that a Persian, a fight against Persians is going to go your way, regardless of how you judge the relative merits of your equipments and your tactics. So that's one point. And the other point is you already have ancient authors like Plutarch, which is very interesting. This is during the Roman period, but he makes a very interesting point about the way Herodotus tells the story. So Herodotus says, oh, well, you know, at the Battle of Plataea, um, and if you want to know more about this, I mean, I did the History Hack um, podcast about this, so please, please do check that out. Um, but Herodotus's account of that says, well, the, the Greeks won because they had better armor and they were more disciplined. And that's that's how they managed to overthrow the, uh, overthrow the Persians. Um, and Plutarch says, well, if that's true, then there's nothing glorious about this, right? If that's if that's how they won, because they just had more armor, then, well, it was foregone conclusion. Like, there's, no, there's nothing cool about this story. That was just obvious. It was always going to happen, right? So he says this is just not satisfactory, even as a story that is meant to glorify Greeks. Because if you want to glorify the Greeks, you have to put them in a position where they are true underdog. Um and I think that is much more likely to be how we should really portray this. I mean, they are a true underdog in various ways. In terms of military organization, um, in terms of equipment, they are sort of mostly equivalent. The Persians have access to lots of heavy infantry. They fight as heavy infantry. So that's that's all fairly much more even. And we can even tell from Herodotus that that's the case. Uh, in terms of organization, they're clearly inferior. The Persians have much more experience managing large armies. It's just a simple objective fact. I mean, Persia, uh, Greeks have no experience managing an army as large as they bring together for the Persian Wars, whereas the Persians have been doing this for decades. Um, so in terms of organization, logistics, they are there's no comparison. The Persians have absolute superiority. Um, in terms of individual weaponry, there's, there's, you know, it's, it's very easy to compare the two. I mean, the difference is really not that great and shouldn't be decisive, except in sort of individual fighting, maybe in some, in some instances. Um, and in terms of strategic approach to these kind of, um, kind of uh, challenges, like the, 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 the challenge of conquering Greece, for instance, versus the challenge of defending Greece. Um, I mean, the Greeks do a lot of things right, but they also do a lot of things wrong. So there's not necessarily a single way that they say, oh, well, they, they just made all the right decisions. I mean, they they are constantly bickering among each other. They can't get everybody in line there. The actual alliance that they muster is, is very fragmented. It's only a handful of states. Um, whereas the Persians are constantly able to outmaneuver the armies they send, to also pick holes in the alliance by approaching individual states, trying to bribe them, trying to threaten them, using all sorts of diplomatic tools to try and break the Greek resistance. So in a lot of ways, this disparity, um, it, it, it is much more weighted against the Greeks um, than the, the the common narrative suggests, you know, which is that all the Greeks came together for their defense, you know, because obviously, because who wouldn't, because the Persians are coming to wipe you out. Well, this is not actually the case at all. Um, in fact, a lot of the ways that the, the Persians made inroads was by exploiting divisions within and among Greek communities. You know, they had delegates from exiled groups within Greece or from from exiled, you know, ousted tyrants and things like that, who came to Persia as the obvious ally to try and put them back into power. So they were using the Persians as an agent of their restoration, which meant that it was very easy for the Persians to control territories that they took by simply put taking some of these, you know, assets and putting them back into place. Or, you know, for instance, with the Thessalians in northern Greece, just saying, well, we're going to go fight your ancestral enemies over these mountains here and focus. Will you back us up or will you fight us? And the Thessalians obviously say, well, we'll back you up, of course. I mean, <laughs> this serves our interest. This is what we've always wanted. So there are a lot of ways in which the Persians have the upper hand, you know, diplomatically, strategically, logistically, you know, tactically. Um, <clears throat> and so that's the narrative that you actually kind of want. If you want to heroize, if you want to, to glorify the Greek achievement, um, it's it's about sort of pointing out, and Herodotus does this quite effectively, just how bad it looked for the Greeks, <laughs> right? Yeah. Just how um, on the ropes they were and how much hinged on the, the perseverance of individual states and even individual units within each battle. Um, you know, the, the, the sheer dogged um, refusal to back down um, on which a lot of this uh, ultimately hinged. But how did they win? That then becomes a much more complex question to answer. Um, 
What, but one of the key things I think that often gets lost in these kind of debates is to see how much the Greek world has changed just in the period of the rise of Persia, because this is a, a pivotal period for the development of Greek states. This is a period in which we see an absolute explosion in the size and level of organization, political and, and urban, urban in terms of urban spaces and things like that, monumentalization, wealth, development of art, development of trade networks. A lot of things are happening in the 6th century, and specifically the second half of the 6th century BC. So just before the Persians arrive, the Greek world is booming, right? And this is for the first time since, you know, the, the, the fall of the Mycenaean palaces. It's been a very slow process of getting together um, new forms of political organization and cohesion. But in the 6th century, this is finally all getting off to a serious um, uh, boom, essentially. And that's the period when you just suddenly see a lot more resources available to these Greek communities. So you see the first, you know, where previously, for instance, warfare has been the business of essentially very small bands of elite warriors. You now see the first arrival of mass hoplite armies. You see the first glimmer of the idea that maybe you can pay these armies so they can stay in the field for a long time rather than having to bring them back to, you know, taking the harvest. You know, this reliance on militia is starting to, um, starting to be sort of built upon a little bit. Um, you start to see city walls spreading in mainland Greece, which previously, I mean, these cities were either just not big enough or they didn't have the financial resources to fortify and to become thereby more effective um, bulwarks of resistance against any, any enemy. So you start to see a lot of military means growing with the economic means and the demographic resources. Um, more people get richer, more people can afford hoplite armor. It's one of those very simple things that, that we tend to forget about, but this is extremely important because it's happening in this period. So you have, for the first time, states that can field thousands of hoplites, which previously just wasn't possible. Um, and the upshot of that, when the Persians invade, is that they get a lot more than they bargained for. I mean, they have been used to fighting relatively less organized states in Ionia, um, which don't have the same sort of level of infrastructure, don't have the same level of state organization until maybe the Ionian revolt. There they do manage to, to crush that sort of new style um, uh, Greek resistance. But when they hit the mainland, they hit sort of much larger states with, with a great deal of recent change that has enabled them to, uh, to achieve quite a bit more militarily. Also in, in form of constructing, for instance, trireme fleets. Um, which in the Ionian Revolt was also something that they sort of encountered in the Greek world for the first time because they had been funding it. The Persians had been making them build the mm -hmm. Trireme fleet, which then used against them. But this spurred other Greek states to also start building it. So you have a lot of these kinds of factors. You have the growth of military resource and the growth of the numbers behind the, behind the military means that would be the biggest obstacle to the Persians. Um, so you see it in, at Marathon when suddenly a single state, Athens, can feel as many as 9,000 hoplites. Well, that has never happened before. You know, in no point in Greek history, as far as we can tell, could a single state actually feel that many. Um, and you see, uh, you know, a, a hint of that in, in 500, the event that triggers the Ionian revolt is the failure of the Persians to take Naxos, which is an island in the Aegean, but which, according to Herodotus, has 8,000 hoplites and a strongly fortified citadel. Well, those are the kind of things that are going to make a lot more trouble for, you know, an invasion army, um, especially an army that is moved amphibiously because it has so much more difficulty with supply, with um, with numbers, with uh, maintaining armies for longer periods out in the field and with maneuver outside of the sailing season. So um, these are the kind of challenges that are starting to emerge from the Greek world. And so the Persians are biting off a lot and they may not realize that they're doing that, right? They, they are suddenly facing a people that they've been told and they have from their own experience for generations have thought that these are people who are divided, small, weak, poor, um, unable to mount resistance against something like the Persian empire. Um, certainly not able to do anything like, you know, the kind of resistance that they've already encountered and crushed in Mesopotamia or Ionia or Egypt. Um, but instead they, you know, they, they suddenly do manage to, band together a significant number of those states and they do manage to organize that defense in a way that doesn't just rely on you know a momentary 
uh, you know, decision to to valorously fight the enemy, but rather it was a sort of more planned strategy using geographical bottlenecks, using fleets uh, to support land armies, these kinds of things. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's that's what you find that is like the, the Persians go in thinking they're going to easily overthrow, most likely anyway, easily overthrow this this Greek alliance. And they find that actually they are evenly matched in a lot of cases and possibly overmatched in, in some of the critical engagements. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's fascinating what you said about how the, you know, the the idea of the, the Inkhan's naval aspect is actually uh, a, a Persian idea. They funded it. That's hilarious. <laughs> and a wonderful irony. So the Persians at the beginning figure that they know what they're fighting and that they can overwhelm it through better organization. Large, we'll say larger numbers more professional, you know, a more professional outfit, we'll say, united outfit. It's worked before. It doesn't work this time twice. Um, And it's not an easy victory for the Greeks by any means. We're going to talk about some battles in the next episode. Um, But it, you know, for all the time I read about the the Greco-Persian Wars, right, um, all the while up until like very recently, I only recently clocked what the double standard it is for people to say, oh, how terrible for the Persian despots to come and try and conquer Greece and take away what they had. <laughs> and then at the same time, everybody's saying, oh, well, well, what what wonderful conquest Alexander the Great did. Does nobody see? <laughs> what do you think about this? Yeah. Do you have thoughts about this? <laughs> No, I mean, but my thought about this is that I think empire in the ancient world is is to a large extent a changing of the guard. I mean, for for ordinary people in many many parts of of the of Asia Minor and the Near East, the fact that Alexander was now in charge with his generals rather than the Persians would have made essentially no difference because they were still paying tribute to the same satrap in the same town who was like the, the regional sort of governor. Um, it's just that he now had a different name and ethnic origin, but mm-hmm. it, it, to a large degree, I would imagine that that it didn't really matter to a lot of people, mm-hmm. except those people who had been required to fight and forced to sort of give their lives to defend this this imperial structure. Mm-hmm. Um, it mattered obviously a lot more for the people who were in charge, <laughs> mm-hmm. that they were no longer in charge, and they had to try and find a new way to accommodate themselves within these new power structures, because being on top is obviously you know mm-hmm. something that is hugely beneficial to the two particular groups and, and not being on top anymore is a difficult pill to swallow. Um, but for I think for, for most of the population, it wouldn't really have mattered. And you actually see this even with the expansion of the Athenian Empire. So after the Persians are defeated, of course, you get the Athenian or the, the Athenian led naval alliance that starts to push back Persian control over a couple of areas in Asia Minor, Cyprus and other places. Um, and in a lot of those places, they just end up having to pay tribute to the Athenians instead. Yeah. And in some cases, you know, when the Persians then show up again by land and say, hey, guys, have you forgotten about us? We're still here. Um, and they, they're not sure how to keep both sides at peace and to keep both either side from attacking them. So they end up, you know, maybe, and this is sort of dubiously attested, but maybe paying tribute to both sides. Because mm-hmm. honestly, what you want as a state like Miletus, when you're caught in the middle of all this, you just don't want anybody to destroy your city again, which the Persians have already done. You know, <laughs> this is something that is is incredibly traumatic for a community and incredibly disruptive and, and violent and horrid. Mm-hmm. And you don't want that to happen. And so what you end up doing when somebody shows up with a massive fleet and say, hey, we're the boss now. You want to pay some tribute, please? You just say, fine, how much? You know, and that's yeah. it. And Absolutely. Whether that matters a lot, well, there's some really interesting evidence that shows that, you know, regardless of where the line in the sand was between Athens and Persia, I mean, trade continued, migration clearly continued, the exchange of ideas obviously continued because Herodotus himself was born in the Persian Empire, which was then liberated by the Athenians. He spent much of his life in Athens and then moved on to Italy. So, I mean, Mm -hmm. ideas, intellectual developments, human beings, goods, they all flow through this world. Mm -hmm. Um, whichever way they want, whichever way they 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 can. And mm-hmm. so I wouldn't necessarily say that it, it there is any way to morally distinguish between Cyrus the Great and Alexander. I mean, they both were, you know, 
conquerors who achieved a great deal for their people, often at the expense of other people. Yeah. Um, and for many, for probably the majority of people in their empires, it really made no effective difference um, who they were paying their tribute to. Yeah, really, I, I think that's very true. And it sort of speaks a little to sort of the war aims that these sort of grand con conquerors sort of seem to have. I mean, you kind of know, because we know how the war, like the various invasions of Greece ended. And I've always felt that the Persian invasion of Greece was essentially a matter of security for the empire, essentially. What do you... Uh, I'm I'm less clear on exactly what Alexander wanted, but um <laughs> well, so are we all, I think. Yeah. <laughs> he, he says what he wants, Holy. but I just don't know whether <laughs> Well, uh, I mean it's always with... yeah, this, this isn't an easy question. So in two minutes or less, um, mm. yeah. <laughs> what motivates conquest? But it's it, for the Persians, it's a very important part that this is their imperial ideology, right? There is initially at least a sense that the king must expand the empire, must expand his reach, must exert his control over all the peoples in the world. Um, which has, you know, it's very difficult to fit that into our modern sense that every act must have a strategic, deeper sort of structural uh, uh, purpose or motivation. It may be random. It may be that the Greeks could have been, you know, it, he could have tried to make another move against steppe peoples in Central Asia or against the Ethiopians like Cambyses had done, but instead he chose the Greeks. There may not have been more to it, but there are also reasons to believe, for instance, especially after the Ionian Revolt, that the Greeks of the mainland were considered to be a disruptive factor. And that's something that for a lot of these emperors is very, very important. Like you want to make sure that your borders are secure and stable. And if there are peoples who are messing with that, then you have to go and subject them as well. It's basically it's just, just a matter of it's true. Um, it's, it's, of, it's, of, of, it's... of security, well, of of being left alone to to run your empire as you see fit, essentially. Yeah. It's just, it's imperial security 101 in a sense, then. So We'll keep that an open question because it is very difficult to answer in less than a minute. We have reached the end of this episode. Thank you all for watching. Please like and subscribe and we'll see you in the next one. Actually, very, very shortly. <laughs> Thank you for watching that video, guys. Please like and subscribe on the way out. And remember, you can use my exclusive code HISTORYLAND for 50% off your subscription at Armchair History TV, where I will be making exclusive content for everybody who is signed up. Thank you again for watching, and I'll see you again for another adventure in history land the next time.